Welcome to this lecture on pharmacology for peripheral nerve blocks. I'd like to title this lecture, The Good News Is That My Block Lasted Forever, and The Bad News Is My Block Lasted Forever, meaning that if a block lasts too long, it becomes at some point worrisome rather than good. The disclosures I have are uh, that of being a research consultant for GE Medical in ultrasound and also being a research consultant for IMD Incorporated International Medical Device. Most people would describe the perfect single shot peripheral nerve block as one that is long duration but not too long as we mentioned just now. Motor sparing, one that does not have neuronal or systemic toxicity, and one that is cost effective. What makes a block last longer? Is it anesthetic concentration? Is it epinephrine? Is it dexamethasone, clonidine, dexmedetomidine? There are a number of things. We will discuss uh, the list here we have on this uh, slide. If we look at uh, local anesthetic concentration, we have to ask in the same breath, what about anesthetic mass? Because many times these two are hard to distinguish. In other words, is the uh, block performed with 10 mLs of half percent bupivacaine equal to the one performed with 20 mLs of quarter percent bupivacaine equal to the one performed with 50 mLs of 0.1 percent bupivacaine? Surprisingly, the answer to this question is not as well known as we might think, and there are still articles addressing this published as recently as 2014, this particular one in anesthesia and analgesia, where they looked at sciatic nerve blocks with the same mass but different concentrations and volumes, namely one block performed with 12 mLs of 2% mepivacaine and another block performed with 24 mLs of 1% mepivacaine. In other words, the same mass but different volumes and concentrations. And what the authors found in this case was that both of these types of blocks lasted about four hours, so that it was difficult to sort out if either of these uh, specifically concentration or volume was the dominant effect. If we look at interscaling block uh, duration and similar studies that have been done to uh, assess this, this particular study was done in 2012, Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine by Fredrickson, uh, where the authors looked at increasing the volume of local anesthetic, specifically ropivacaine 0.375%, from 10 mLs to 40 mLs, which caused an increase in the duration from 10 hours to 15 hours. Likewise, when the authors increased the concentration but left the volume the same using 20 mLs of 0.375 versus 20 mLs of 0.75%, the block duration increased from 11 to 14 hours. When they used a low volume and uh, uh, overall mass, specifically 0.75% 5 mLs, they simply had a very high failure rate. So we know from these studies that we've just looked at that below a critical mass of local anesthetic, be that volume or concentration, we get a failed block. As we increase the, the uh, mass of local anesthetic, whether that's by volume and or concentration, we get some increasing duration that is limited to a plateau effect of probably somewhere around a 20 to 40% increase in duration by increasing the mass. However, what I'd like to talk about now is the fact that sometimes what you don't see is just as important or even more important than what you do see as illustrated in this picture. What I mean when I say this is that you never see prolonged single injections at low concentrations. In other words, because bupivacaine has a graded response giving uh, mainly sensory and analgesic uh, effects at 0.1 percent and these effects increasing to sensory and motor at 0.125 and 0.25 percent and dense motor and sensory at 0.5 percent. However, what we don't ever see is uh, the ability to produce a long single injection sensory and or analgesic specific block. So it's tough to see limited duration 
at low concentrations when we use a single injection. Almost all of the studies that have tried to increase the duration of blocks have been performed with high concentrations of local anesthetic and are associated with dense motor and sensory blocks. Now you may ask, so what if I get a dense motor block? I really don't care, so I'm not going to put in a catheter or look for any other alternatives because I can make my block last for a long time. Uh, and I don't really care if I get a motor block. So really, if we separate the types of blocks into either I care or I don't care, I think most people would agree that you care if you get a dense motor block with an inner scalene because we know that it impairs diaphragm function and also patients don't ha like having a lifeless extremity. It's very claustrophobic or bothersome to many patients. By contrast, if we look at an adductor canal block, most people don't care because it doesn't cause a motor block and all of the area that is affected by the block is covered by a dressing so the patient can't be as anxious, uh, meaning that they, they don't know if it's numb or not with the dressing intact. Some of the things uh, that are bothersome about a femoral block are the risk of falls or the inability to rehab or walk after uh, major knee surgery. Sciatic and popliteal fossa uh, is debatable. Some might argue that uh, the patient's not going to be weight bearing on that extremity anyway, so weight uh, motor function is not a significant factor, and that most of the sensory portion is covered up by the dressing, which gives the patient less anxiety about being numb. So you could argue that, that goes in the don't care category. Ermi was the first one to really point out the uh, significance of how common diaphragm dysfunction is after interscaling block. And in this uh, x-ray, we see the elevated hemidiaphragm um, on the uh, patient's uh, right side. In their study back in 1991, the authors used 1.5% mepivacaine with a mean volume of 43 mLs. None of the patients enrolled in the study had pre-existing lung disease. 100% of them subsequently, subsequent to the block developed paradoxical uh, motion of the diaphragm on ultrasound. There was noticeable dyspnea in these patients without pre-existing lung disease in five of 13 patients. Now, we uh, repeated a study similar to this, but it was a randomized prospective double-blind study where we compared the effects of 0.25% and 0.125% bupivacaine on diaphragm function. And what we found in this study was that uh, if we looked and graded the diaphragm function as normal, meaning the diaphragm uh, excursion was caudad during inspiration and cephalad during expiration uh, versus no movement or paradoxical movement, that 21% of patients only had um, dysfunction of the diaphragm when we used 0.125%. By contrast, uh, upwards of 70 and nearly 80% had absent or paradoxical motion uh, at that concentration. Subsequent to this study, we've reduced our concentration to 0.1% for our loading dose and the infusion, which is only 5 mLs an hour. We get very, very good relief with this concentration and volume. This is how we assess the diaphragm. Uh, the cephalad uh, aspect on the left, the caudad on the right. Notice that as we um, have the patient breathe, we see caudad displacement with inspiration and cephalad with expiration. Now this is what you can achieve with a very dilute continuous infusion of local anesthetic, but is nigh impossible to achieve for long durations with a single shot. Give me a thumbs up and then open your hand, spread your fingers apart, put them together, and clench your fist, bend your wrist back. Bend your wrist back. Good. Good. And good. And how much pain are you having right now? Good. Okay. Zero. Awesome. Now, I will admit that is a shameless testimonial, but uh, it's not uncommon to get good results like this with a loading dose of 0.1% on the initiation of the block and a continuous infusion, 0.1%. You can't get that with a single injection without dense motor block. What about epinephrine? We put epinephrine in local anesthetics to extend the block duration, use it as a marker for intravascular injection, and to reduce the peak plasma concentration of local anesthetics. 
As a marker for intravascular injection, likewise, it's surprising that we still have studies coming out looking at this as recently as 2013, but I think this one's very relevant because what the authors looked at was how uh, reliable epinephrine was as a marker for intravascular injection in patients who were on chronic beta blockade, which is a very valid question to ask. So what they did was use a, a randomized prospective double-blind uh, protocol they gave intravenous epinephrine 15 micrograms, and they defined the uh, definition of an intravascular injection was a heart rate change of 20 beats per minute. So if they were able to detect a change in heart rate of 20 beats per minute, that was deemed a, as, a, as a positive, uh, reliable marker for intravascular injection. And in this case, the specificity was 100%, sensitivity was only 38%. But when they lowered the threshold for defining a positive intravascular injection to a heart rate change of 10 beats per minute, the specificity was 88%, and the most importantly, sensitivity was 100%. So this is a very valuable study, I think, and, and reinforces our uh, using this to mark intravascular injection. Um, in uh, another study, uh, authors looked at whether or not uh, epinephrine reliably caused tachycardia as a marker of intravascular injection in patients sed uh, sedated with fentanyl uh, and on propofol nitrous oxide. And once again, using 15 mics of epinephrine and a threshold of 20 beats per minute, the specificity was 100%, but the sensitivity was only 85. However, when you reduce the threshold to 10 beats per minute, both specificity and sensitivity were 100%. And I think most of us, if we're watching our patients care, uh, carefully, can notice a difference of 10 beats per minute. So what about reducing peak plasma concentrations of local anesthetics? Is it worth using epinephrine for this? Again, surprisingly, a study as recently as 2013, the authors used 60 mLs of ropivacaine 0.75% with and without epinephrine. And there was a significant difference in the, we'll go back to that uh, slide, there was a significant difference in the peak plasma concentrations of ropivacaine, the patients without epinephrine being in the solid circles and the uh, open circles being those with epinephrine. So you can see that the patients who received epinephrine never achieved uh, uh, the peak plasma concentrations that those without epinephrine achieved. What about block duration? Most of us uh, have the notion that epinephrine prolongs block duration because of studies that were done early on short and intermediate acting local anesthetics, in this case lidocaine. Uh, back in 1965, plain lidocaine lasted 35 minutes on the ulnar nerve, uh, and um, lidocaine with epinephrine lasted 190 minutes. However, if we look at uh, modern studies using uh, long-acting local anesthetics such as ropivacaine, there is not a significant difference uh, in tap blocks and likewise not a significant difference, only 12, 12 hours and 11 hours uh, with and without for femoral nerve block. If you're going to use local anesthetic with epinephrine, be mindful of the fact that plain epinephrine has a pH of 6.5 and a range of 5 to 7, lidocaine or other uh, local anesthetics that come pre-mixed with epinephrine off the shelf contain metabisulfites as well as methylparaben, and methylparaben is more a function of it being multi-dose vial. Metabisulfite is a function of uh, preventing oxidation of epinephrine and uh, degradation in, in, in the uh, solution. Also, the, epine the uh, local anesthetic is acidified to stabilize the epinephrine in solution, often down to a pH of as low as 3.3. Now, what does this mean? Well, this study, albeit was done in chondrocytes, uh, still demonstrated that if you look across the bottom of this table between control uh, 100,000, uh, uh, 1 to 100,000, 1 to 200,000 epinephrine, you can see the toxicity is fairly low. It takes a real jump uh, up with metabisulfite. So metabisulfite is fairly toxic, and in this case, to chondrocytes. So we are extrapolating if we talk about neural, neural tissue. But nonetheless, this is not reassuring.
Uh, likewise, if we look at uh, pH as it relates to cell death and chondrocytes, we see a big jump in the cell death rate between 5.5, 5, and 4.5, which is uh, the lower pH is being associated with premixed epinephrine containing local anesthetics. What about dexamethasone? Is dexamethasone worth it? Uh, in one study as recently as 2010, where authors looked at bupivacaine uh, 20 ml 0.5%, in these patients, they already had both epinephrine and clonidine. With the addition of 8 milligrams of decadron, the sensory and motor uh, block durations went from 14 and 14 to 24 and 23 hours, respectively. So this is a very significant increase in the duration of sensory and motor effect. Now, we like the sensory, however, we may not like the motor so much if it's an interscaling block and we've got shortness of breath. In a uh, meta-analysis of brachial plexus blocks with and without dexamethasone, the analgesic effect was prolonged from 12 to 22 hours and the motor from 11 to 18 hours. A significant uh, factor that has come to light about dexamethasone recently um, in this case, the uh, British Journal of Anesthesia in 2013, the authors pointed out that when they used 30 mLs of 0.5% bupivacaine and looked at the median duration of analgesia, they got 13 hours with plain ropivacaine with IV addition of dexamethasone increased to 21, and with perineural, it increased to 23. Likewise, in this study, and in this study, we're looking at uh, this was 2014, also uh, bupivacaine. Now, this is not the absolute duration, but this is the change in analgesic duration. With perineural, 13 hours. With uh, intravenous, 8. So even though uh, we know that um, intravenous dexamethasone can prolong even uh, blocks when it's given intravenously, there's a consistent and not always statistically significant uh, increase in duration when we look at perineural versus intravenous. So what about the hyperglycemic response in dexamethasone? This was a study that was done in 2013, anesthesia and analgesia, where they looked at the changes in plasma glucose during the perioperative period, in, specifically in patients with and without diabetes and those who received and didn't receive dexamethasone. <clears throat> the uh, issues uh, we also want to talk about are wound healing, uh, hyperglycemia, and infection. And in this meta-analysis done in uh, 2011, 2,700 plus patients, uh, this study was done to show that you could get some analgesic effect with uh, doses at, of 0 0.1 milligrams per kilogram but more importantly than the fact that they caused some reduction in pain scores and opioid consumption was that none of these patients had associated wound healing or infection problems. Now we mentioned earlier <clears throat> about the hyperglycemic response and when we look at this on the left panel we see the change in glucose perioperatively between pre-op, incision, um, um, middle of the surgery and closure and if you look at this, you'll see that in non-diabetics, although they started at a lower glucose, their change in glucose during surgery was higher than uh, diabetics whose glucoses started higher but not, did not change as much. So although uh, diabetics ended up being higher, the delta glucose intraoperatively was not as great in diabetics. And even more importantly, if you look at patients who were diabetics and got dexamethasone, their increase in glucose, whether they got dexamethasone or placebo, was no different. So is dexamethasone worth it? It's cheap. It significantly prolongs blocks. Some recent evidence suggests that IV is, has effect uh, and may be equal to perineural, although it seems to be consistently a little less duration than perineural. <clears throat> what about clonidine? Is clonidine a long run for a short slide? In this review article, um, uh, I'm sorry, the meta-analysis in 2009, they looked at the effect of the addition of clonidine to peripheral nerve blocks. <clears throat> 
what they, the authors found was that in this meta-analysis of 20 randomized controlled trials, clonidine prolonged the duration of analgesia and sensory block on average of about two hours. Uh, this was associated with uh, arterial hypotension, sedation, bradycardia. Um, so in addition to the fact that it doesn't prolong very much, has a fairly significant side effect profile, the facts about clonidine are that it's a single dose vial. The cost for a generic uh, can range anywhere from as high as 52 up above to $24, which is the best you would actually get. And the patient will be charged probably 300% of that uh, cost. Even more importantly, if we look at rat sensory neurons and cell death when exposed to either plain local anesthetic, local anesthetic with dexamethasone, <clears throat> buprenorphine, or clonidine, you can see that clonidine is pretty high on the list, 80% significantly more cell death with clonidine compared to dexamethasone or plain ropivacaine. What about dexmedetomidine? This was looked at uh, in interscaling blocks for shoulder surgery and anesthesia and analgesia in 2016. 99 patients uh, received either IV dexmedetomidine or perineural or control, and the dose was half a microgram per kilogram. In this study, the uh, authors found that the duration, and this is not the change in analgesia duration, this is the absolute duration, was 6.7 hours for the control. It was increased to 10.9 for perineural and 9.8 for IV. So compared, uh, this is in the same ballpark as quantity, in other words, not that long. Um, and very, very uh, close to clonidine, but not nearly as long a prolongation as dexamethasone. Likewise, if you look at the opioid consumption in patients who got uh, perineural IV or no dexmedetomidine, you can see that at the 24-hour interval, there was no significant difference. The only significant difference in the opioid consumption was in the first eight hours. So looking at the duration of uh, analgesia that we get from this, which is 10.9 hours, that's less than half of the duration that we get with uh, long-acting local anesthetics with uh, dexamethasone. And by the way, the wholesale cost per vial of dexmedetomidine is $45, meaning the patient would, would pay uh, three times that. So we're going to leave off there with this quote. An expert is someone who knows more and more about less and less until they know everything about nothing. Thanks.